that. Today's lesson comes from the book of Samuel, 1 Samuel uh, chapter 16, and the uh, first couple of verses. Samuel was the last of the judges. As you read the book of Judges, that's how I keep, uh, okay, where's Samuel in the Bible? Where's, where's the kings? Uh, that's kind of my little uh, remembrance of that. But he's the last judge. And uh, in today's story, it mentions the first king of Israel, which was Saul. And Samuel, being a prophet, anointed Saul to be king, and, uh, and that was the role then of the holy man uh, in the country. And uh, maybe it was just my church, so I can't really speak here. But in my church, we talked a lot about when I was a child uh, about the stories, and Samuel was one that I remember really clearly. Okay? Samuel was the one that. Uh, I told my kids, I kind of used uh, the same dramatics about his call. And, uh, and then also in the book of Samuel, we read about David and Goliath. And uh, probably touch a little bit on that. But I also remember being taught that Samuel was also a model for friendships. The friendship between David and Jonathan. Jonathan was the uh, King Saul's son. And so I remember that stress. So I passed that on to my kids. Uh, I passed that on where I could. And, uh, but Saul's reign as a king was really a, a failure. He started out good. He was humble. He was a big tall guy. The um, Bible says he was head and shoulders above kind of everybody else. But uh, when the Lord would uh, go before Israel, when they went into battle especially, that uh, uh, Samuel would go to Saul and tell him, the Lord wants you to do this or that. One time it was just, I want you to kill all the animals in the enemy's camp. He didn't do that. Okay. He thought, felt like uh, he'd just say those and God doesn't quite understand, so I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do that. And little by little, he just disobeyed God. Okay? His proud spirit modified everything that the Lord said to do, and God just rejected his leadership. Okay? And it says that Samuel mourned for Saul. Every time he tell him to do uh, what the Lord had spoken to him to tell him and he'd see otherwise he'd go back and say whoa you know the Lord's not pleased with you doing that okay and uh, and so he grieved for him he mourned for him and that's where we're kind of on this uh, 16th chapter here when I read these first few verses here the Lord said to Samuel Verse 1 of chapter 16. How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him as king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and be on your way. I'm sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. But Samuel said, How can I go? Saul will hear about it and kill me. The Lord said, take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Invite Jesse to the sacrifice and I'll show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Samuel did what the Lord said. When he arrived at Bethlehem, the elders of the town trembled when they met him. They asked, do you come in peace? Samuel replied, Yes, in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Then he consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice. 
Greg, would you pray for me as I attempt to do God's will? Heavenly Father, just take this uh, scripture that was just read and just embrace it and uh, continue to read around that chapter to get the full knowledge of what you're trying to explain here. Good work, give us a good word. We need it to study it some more. I do this in your name, Lord Jesus Christ, our friend. Amen. Amen. Thank you. So when this conversation started with the Lord saying, I want you to go and anoint another king, he knew what Saul would do. And uh, all eyes were on Samuel, whatever he did, wherever he went. And so the Lord said, you just take a heifer with you, and uh, I'll indicate what I want you to do when you get there. But you invite him, Jesse, uh, who was the father of David, okay? who was the son of Ruth and Boaz. And the important thing there is the lineage of David, okay? the lineage of Jesus Christ okay? through David. And we read that in the book of Matthew and, and uh, in espousing that Jesus' lineage was there from the get-go. So he went, and I think it's interesting there that uh, verse 4, that the people said, you come in peace. <laughs> I mean, this was a holy man, and when God spoke to him about coming against the enemies of God, whether they be in Israel or outside coming in, uh, he made you tremble. <laughs> he was a little bit worried about it. Uh, this day and age, sad to say, we don't really get that because this was a great amount of respect towards Samuel. And so then he went to Jesse and said, I'm going to make a sacrifice. That's what they did to God. They kill an animal and make a sacrifice unto God. So it seemed like it uh, wouldn't draw any more attention. And he accepted the invitation. Jesse did. Jesse had seven sons at home. Okay. When each son was brought before Samuel, and that's the rest of the chapter. I'm not going to read. Uh, but each son was brought, and Samuel thought, boy, this eldest son, he's a pretty big guy. I bet this is the one that the Lord's going to anoint. And the Lord said, you look at the outside, I look at the heart different. God still does that when he looks at the inside of us. Now, I've heard people say it, maybe even said it. You've seen people say it. God knows my heart when you question something. Wow, I've never seen that done before. God knows my heart in this situation. God does know our hearts. And so as these seven came before him, nothing was indicating to Samuel that any of those were to be anointed. So he turned to Jesse and said, is this all your sons? He said, oh, we got one, the youngest. He's out tending sheep. He said, would you go get him? And we will, as, as it says in the latter part there, the 11th chapter, we won't sit down until he arrives. Okay? There was an expectancy. This whole thing about sitting down, standing up. I know uh, some churches that I pastored when we would read the word, like, like just read the scripture, uh, people would stand. Okay? Uh, whether it's the gospel, whether it's Samuel, whatever. You know? um, some congregations, the same thing. Okay? We see that a lot in the African American when the preachers preach at something and then boom, that hits your spirit, you stand up as kind of an affirmation to what's being said. Because God knows your heart and God knows why you're standing. You don't have to explain to anybody else. I stand with you, Lord. Okay. You know, standing fast in God, standing in the promises of God, it's all kind of mixed in there. God did not reveal to Samuel who this king was to be anointed. 
So here comes this eighth son into the crowd, said he was Rudy, which was kind of like red, fair reflected, yet handsome, it says. A fine appearance and handsome features, it tells us in verse 12. And the Lord spoke to Samuel, saying, Rise up. He already was up. Okay. But he made a motion. I have a, I have a wedding this week, Butler. Friday, and when the bride comes, I will go. Would we please rise? A matter of respect for the bride, a matter of respect, because also in the wedding, um, when every, the bride does arrive, then the family is going to get up and pray for the bride and pray for the groom before we even start. Okay? So, there's a number of ways to show respect unto God show respect to the people and all of these are um, respectful things I, I'm just pointing that out I'm not asking you to stand for this that and the other but to explain why they were standing okay. said rise and anoint him in verse 13 so Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the presence of his brothers and from that day on the spirit of the Lord came upon David in power. Samuel then left. Okay? He went to reign. In the presence of his brothers, he was anointed. As I read this story, and then I um, pull more scripture in the 17th chapter, his brothers were a little ticked. Okay? They wanted to be king. Okay? Kind of like Joseph and his brothers. A little rough there, you know. I didn't have any brothers, but uh had two kids, three kids, two of which were boys, and I saw the interaction between always a rivalry, always a competition. Okay? <laughs> you know, don't get nervous, Greg. I, I'm not talking about you guys or, or anybody else, but I, but my own boys. When they would even watch the television, wanted to be on the floor like this. That other one was going for that arm. Okay, he was going for that arm. Okay. Or maybe act like he stumbled, slide a kick in there. You know, just something agitating. You know, I saw a real camaraderie in them in many other ways. But these brothers were angry. Okay, here was their little snot-nosed brother. Okay, <laughs> uh, they put him out there watching the sheep while they did whatever they do, chores around the house, or several went to war as it indicates in the 17th chapter that David went back to taking care of the sheep. I mean, think about that. He was just anointed by the holy man to be the king. His dad must have known the significance of that. Get back out there and take care of the sheep. You know? This is where I think of the New Testament scripture where it said, a prophet's not without honor save in his own country and among his own people. Okay? I talk to people all the time back in my hometown, either texting or uh, through the internet. Some are on our web page. I would, God would never have me be the pastor of Jefferson County where I came from. Okay? It's just against the scriptures. Not a hometown boy. Okay? People remember the hometown boy. They'll never see the man of God. Okay? You'll never see the man of God. You may think I'm sincere about my belief. Sincere about. But God knows in my heart. Wherever it puts me. I need to be loyal to him. But people. With unbelief. It won't help. Okay? I didn't grow up here as bad as I. Talk with Pat about sports. And teaching and the school. I'll never connect like I would connect where I came from. Okay? I think it's interesting to note that David was born in Bethlehem. Kind of know another character who was born in Bethlehem. Don't you? He went back to just doing what he was doing. Okay? Tending sheep. 
But the anointing of God was on him. The power of God was in his life. He was different. Okay? He may not felt anything, but it was different. And I want us to just, uh, I'd like for you to read the 17th chapter on your own. I'm going to paraphrase some, some of that, but just to kind of tie this together. That the next day, he went out and took care of the sheep while some of his brothers went with Saul the king to square off with the Philistines. Okay? For the next 40 days, they were in this valley squared off while the Philistines war leader Goliath come out and called out the army of Israel. Then he called out the God of Israel. Okay? Nine feet tall, had a Weapons bearer, as you read that, you think, wow, that was one huge guy. Okay? And from his youth, he was a warrior, a fighter. Back and forth, calling out, people ran. After that first day or so, Jesse said to his new king son, Hey David, tomorrow got somebody else looking after the sheep. I want you to take some food to your brothers and to the commander of the army as they're squared off with the Philistines. Bring me word back of what's taking place. I really want to know, okay? So here comes the, you know, I, I here comes David, the Aaron boy now, okay? The king, anointed king, okay? He went and took the food. He took the food, the corn. He took the loaves of bread to his brothers. He took other provisions to the commander. Man, something was off. He, he just knew something was off. When you and I have the spirit of God in our lives, we know when something's off. I mean, off, okay? We can walk into a church, we can walk into a Bible study, we can walk in our backyard. There's just something off, okay? You automatically slip into this prayer time. You begin to pray for things you have no understanding or knowledge about, or people in dire straits, or people that have cancer, or people who need prayers okay? don't think it's strange in the next couple of days you're praying for people across the pond in Afghanistan that God says pray for them maybe a simple little prayer it may be just something a little more specific maybe you're watching something on TV and say I never even thought of that okay? I never even thought of that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray for those people I'm going to pray for Operation Pineapple, or I'm going to pray for the Shadow Warriors, or I'm going to pray for those folks that are in under the radar, you know, that are slipping the Christians out, or the, the Nazarenes that have got a big program, getting their people out, okay? You just know that. David, <clears throat> what's going on here? Something's out of whack. What's all the men over here? And who's that big guy over there pacing back and forth? What's he saying? What's he saying? He's saying about my God, what? And so he's there with his brothers. They're angry that he's there. What'd you come here for? So you could see us be shamed, put to shame. He said, no, I want to know what you get if you knock that guy out. Oh, come on, you're just a kid. He was 18 years old when he was anointed, okay? I don't know about you, but I pretty much knew everything by 18. <laughs> Okay. Maybe it was 16, even. Okay. Kind of knew everything. I heard that echo with, with, my, uh, with my boys. I won't say with my daughter. Okay. Not because she's here, but I did hear that. I ain't going to take any orders when I turn 18 from nobody. Okay. Where are you living? Okay. Where are you eating? Okay. You give me orders when I'm 18? Just like 17. Same deal. Same deal 19. Okay. 
I knew when I reached those ages, just by the looks on mom and dad's face, it was time to go do something. Okay? Get a job. What? I don't have to go to school now. I just go. Just drive around. Who pays for the gas? Well, you're my dad. You're my mom. So get a job. Get a home. Get married. Blah, blah, blah. Wow. You got to do all that? Uh, if you don't want to take orders, then you got married and I found out somebody else get an order. <laughs> you never escape it. Okay? If you got a job, somebody's telling you what to do. Okay? So you got to get that mindset rearranged there. All the men fled. David kept asking, asking, asking. They pushed him up to Saul. Saul said, so you want to go out there and fight this guy? You're just a kid, okay? These are my own words. It's the story. He said, listen, when I tended my dad's flock, Jesse, I killed a lion and I killed a bear. Some lions in that region could be as long as nine feet. That's a big lion. Everyone from Dale Dan, okay? And the bears, I don't think I need to even describe to you about the bears. 18 year old, he's not a man with a sword, he's a man with a sling. Whoa, it's a little different. Not with the javelin, not with the sword, he's the sling guy. And he even pursued the bear and took the lamb out of the bear's mouth. Killed it. Well, I guess that's reference point enough. All right, king says, get the armor out, put on him. My armor, the king's armor. David's weighing down, listen, I can't do this. This, 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 this is your stuff, not mine. I just need a sling, my pouch, and a few stones, and I can take this guy down. Yeah, right. Okay. Maybe the brothers were just thrilled. Maybe this little punk here, that we're going to shut his mouth when he gets out there with that lion, and he's going to get his coming up at us. Okay. And he went out. Okay. He went out before the whole company, before Saul. For everyone. Okay. And David said to the Philistine, verse 45, You come out against me with sword, spear, and javelin, but I come out against you in the name of the Lord Almighty, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will hand you over to me, and I'll strike you down and cut off your head. He didn't have a sword. Today I will give the carcasses of the Philistine army to the birds of the air and the beasts of the earth. And the whole world will know there is a God in Israel. All those gathered here will know that it is not by the sword or the spear that the Lord saves. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give all of you into our hands. As the Philistine moved closer to attack him, Goliath was really ticked. This little kid, is that the best you got over there? Okay, and you're sitting out, it's insulting to me, okay? All right, okay kid, getting a little irritated with him. And so he moved to attack David. And David, ran quickly toward the battle line to meet him. I guess he's not going to talk about negotiations here. Reaching into his bag and taking out a stone, he slung it and struck the Philistine on the forehead. The stone sank into his head and he fell face down on the ground. So David triumphed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone. Without a sword in his hand, he struck down the Philistine and killed him. 
David ran and stood over him. He took hold of the Philistine's sword and drew it from the scabbard. After he killed him, he cut off his head with the sword. When the Philistines saw their hero was dead, they turned and ran. Then the men of Israel and Judah surged forward with a, with a shout and pursued the Philistines to the entrance of Gath and the gates of Ekron. Their dead were strewn along the road to Gath and Ekron. When the Israelites returned from chasing the Philistines, they plundered their camp. David took the Philistines' head and brought it to Jerusalem, and he put the Philistines' weapons in his own tent. Whoa! <laughs> Whoa! God can do amazing things in our lives. Okay? There have been giants that he's wiped out. Okay? Things that we've thought, maybe uh, I'm getting a little overboard here. I don't know if I can ever get there. I don't think I can do this, that. When the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you and I, it doesn't make any difference what giant there is in our lives. He gives us the power to overcome that. It's His victory. I know it sounds like craziness. Sounds like, what? It probably looked pretty foolish as the Philistine went forward to attack David and David ran towards him. Maybe the brothers had a second change of heart and thought, oh man, that little kid's going to get it. He's going to get smeared all over the place. Okay. People look at our lives and say, wow. God has done a marvelous work in the lives of those people. Okay. I thought of each of you as I thought of this servant. I, I told Sue yesterday, I said, oh man, the Lord's changing my sermon. I, I, had, I had a really good ending, I thought, really good, and you know, but when we go about doing what is ordinary things in our lives, okay, and the Lord's hand is upon it, it's different from anything that could possibly happen. God doesn't want me to get the credit. He doesn't want you to get the credit. He wants the credit. Okay? He wants to, to receive the glory. I'm just going to read out a couple things that I that I have here. I'm not doing this to embarrass you. Please don't run up here and smack me all over the place or anything else like this, but I want to just single out, okay? I'm going to single out Larry, a deacon on our board. Ordained deacon. The only ordained deacon that I've met since I've been here, okay? He's been in and out of the hospital. God pulls him aside talk to him, to love him. He's not there because he's doing something wrong. The doctor might say, yeah, you're doing this, that. But he's using the time to say, you know, I'm the difference in your life. It's been great. God spared your life. Most people be dead going off that roof, okay? Or pretty well beaten up. But I saw the hand of God work in the power of God transforming. I saw us and the community rally around that, giving support. These are not normal kinds of things we go through, okay? Don and Sally, you knew you wouldn't be exempt, you know, I'd say something. In North Carolina, some people would have been dead by what you experienced, okay? You went there to see family, to relax, get break out of this lockdown stuff, okay? And here you are with us. You know, I just say thanks, Sally, because every time I go to the webpage, I see where Sally is sharing that devotion with somebody. And not because I'm some brilliant writer or I got copied something to somebody else. But we're getting the word out, okay? We're getting the word out. 
we take serious about getting his word out. Darren's, oh my goodness, how many people in here have had brain surgery? Okay. Some people say, I don't have one. Okay. Get in there, look around, and you know. But you're with us. Okay. You're with us. Okay. Carl saying you're not going to get out of this one either. Okay. Your recent hospitalizations. God's mercy. You're back with us. Okay. Whether you think you're back or you're not back, you're back with us. Okay. okay. I'm not going to just go around the table. So you're in good shape. Barb, I see you sitting over there. I don't even have your name on here. But what God did by you had COVID shots. We all have testimonies here. Since I met you, don't take this the wrong way. Since I met you, I've had five stints and 38 radiation treatments. Okay? <laughs> Not because of you, but I'm just saying what God's done in each of us to say, okay, you're here by the power of God. The power of God's in you and these may be ordinary things to some other people, but they're God's plan to say, we're not a quitting group of people, okay? We may dwell, we may get down in numbers. I'll put you against any, any church in this community, okay? Your spirit, okay? So what if we're not sophisticated with some kind of music or anything else? We love God with all of our hearts. Amen. This church was founded on the principles of Jesus Christ. And we do this in remembrance of Him. We go about our ordinary jobs, our ordinary way of life. These things slow us down and then just rev us right back up again. Okay? The best is yet to come. The best is yet to come here. Okay? I know why you know, people say, well, you've been praying for new people, you've been praying for this, that, and the other. I found out Wednesday, not for the first time, but Noah preached 120 years, and the only ones that made it were his family. Okay. But he kept on preaching. He kept on lifting up about the mercy of God, the love of God, and Jesus tells us in Isaiah 61 and 1, that he is the anointed one and he's our leader you know whether we're dripping with oil or we don't have any oil you know i i used to really as a young christian i used to pull, feel my forehead and i feel oil on that thing i thought what, what what's that oil on my head lord he said it's my oil it's my brand just like i baptized you i put my marks on your life frank 